for the exogenously extended organizational complex functioning as an integrated homeostatic system unconsciously, we propose the term cyborg. I'm sorry, what? Sixty-two years ago, Manfred Kleins and Nathan Klein coined the term cyborg. It's a mashup of cybernetic and organism. This seemingly simple word became and remains wildly popular, both in fictional storytelling and in reality. But what does it actually mean to be a cyborg? Kleins and Klein didn't necessarily specify what makes you a cyborg. There just has to be some sort of external component that augments our bodies. Do drugs count? Meditation? Prosthetics? surgery, or even glasses? What exactly are these exogenous or outside of the body components that they refer to? People don't necessarily agree, but personally, I like the original definition. The key here is self-regulation, the ability to manage and understand your reactions to what's happening around you. These outside technologies need to assist you in near real time to respond to our environments, whether by extending or augmenting our innate capabilities. So what kind of augmentations do these cyborgs have? Let's start with augmenting our senses. Using technology to enhance or to augment our senses has been around for a really long time, and it's becoming more and more common by the day. There is technology now to help us enhance our abilities to taste, smell, feel, hear, and see when managing sensory disabilities. Take cochlear implants. These devices are very similar to hearing aids, but instead of them being a separate component that you take in and out of your ear as needed, they're surgically implanted. So why would we use these over standard hearing aids? Hearing aids are essentially speakers. They pick up sound through an external microphone and amplify that sound so that the damaged ear is able to pick it up. Cochlear implants also have that speaker, but instead of just blasting the sound into your ear, it communicates directly with your auditory nerve. While this doesn't solve hearing loss, it increases the wearer's awareness of the sounds in their environment, which can help a lot with speech understanding. It is an improvement over the standard hearing aid. So what's the downside? Well, for one, there will always be training and therapy that needs to happen after the surgery, but that's pretty standard. Not to mention that any surgery carries some risk, although this one is very safe. The real downside is that these things need to be powered, so you're stuck swapping batteries daily. We aren't quite at the point where we can use our bodies to power these implants, but that's a topic for another video. Technology can also be used to extend our senses beyond what humans are naturally capable of. Noise cancelling headphones are a great example of this. That moment when you put them on and the world goes into silence. Imagine if you could do that at any time, anywhere, without the use of headphones. Ear wearables can filter noise, amplify important sounds like speech, and even transpose frequencies that are undetectable to the human ear into ones we can hear. We've only talked about one of our senses and some of the ways augmentation could help. What about sensors that would allow us to see into the ultraviolet and infrared spectrum more easily? Or a sensor that would allow us to measure chemicals and simulate a scent for them, allowing us to detect what is hazardous and what isn't. There's a lot of opportunity there. Despite all this, when you mention cyborgs and the concept of augmentation to people, the first thing they tend to think of is... I feel like everyone has imagined what it would be like to run super fast or jump super high or lift really heavy things. Becoming a cyborg seems like a really great way to make your sessions at the gym a little bit easier, although I think that might completely defeat the purpose of going to the gym in the first place, but let's talk about what augmented action actually is. Augmented action is when technology is used to sense our actions or our intention to act and then sync a similar action with a machine. Prosthetics, in particular, are incredible. Many prosthetic limbs and exoskeletons now have the ability, in some cases, to fully restore people's ranges of motion when they are compromised. This is already being done today with robots that are designed for surgery, especially in remote or hazardous environments. Surgical robots allow surgeons to perform complex procedures with high precision and minimized human error. Now, these machines are very expensive, but technology has a habit of progressing at an exponential rate. Take one look at Michael Reeves' interpretation of a surgery robot, and you'll see how far one person can progress with determination and time. Though I don't think we'll be seeing his version in hospitals anytime soon. But what was the definition for cyborg again? The cyborg deliberately incorporates exogenous components extending the self-regulatory control function. 
There it is, extending. Much like sensory augmenting technology, this technology also has the ability to extend far beyond what is possible for people naturally. It can help us to lift more, move faster, and handle hazardous substances. Exoskeletons are a perfect example. They're external frames that allow people to perform physical feats that the normal human body isn't capable of. But the most talked about would be integrated augments, which are augments that partially or completely replace a part of our body. While we aren't seeing this kind of technology in the general public yet, it isn't that unreasonable to expect it in the future. Much of it does exist in labs and hacker garages across the world. What about the big one? We've talked about our senses and our bodies, but what about what controls it all? What about augmented cognition? The human brain has roughly 2.5 petabytes of memory. That's 2,500 terabytes or 2.5 million gigabytes. What if we could double that or quadruple it? What if we didn't have to forget anything anymore or if we could choose what we forgot? What if we had perfect recall if everyone had a photographic memory? Augmented cognition uses technology to understand the user's cognitive state and adapt to address their current or predicted needs. Sensory memory, working memory, attention, and executive function could all be supported with augmented cognition. Neuromodulation is a form of this that specifically targets nerves to normalize or modulate nerve signals. This process can result in pain relief, tremor control, and more. It can also be used to treat mental health disorders. However, this does lead to a very important topic. If augmented cognition gives us the ability to monitor our health at all times or give us perfect memory recall, who else has access to that information? Let's talk about the ethics of augmentation. Is there actually such a thing as privacy? Targeted ads, privacy policies, home automation, whether or not the government is listening are just a few of the topics that are debated daily. What would happen if we introduced augments? Users of augmented technology should be worried. After all, what data is more sensitive than our biological data? Other than a signature and a promise, how can we be sure that this data isn't being shared without our consent? After all, think about what health insurance companies could do with this information. The other concern is for the people that the user interacts with. A lot of the tech around human augmentation that lives in the consumer-facing space, such as the failed Google Glass, has been heavily criticized for potentially recording or viewing private information of other people without their consent. In 2012, a researcher named Steve Mann was allegedly assaulted at a McDonald's by employees for the augmented reality device he had over his eyes. It's worth mentioning that he had a doctor's note to use the device at all times. We'll link a news article about the event in the description below. If the idea of someone in a fast food chain wearing AR glasses makes you nervous for your privacy, Mann asks that you consider the inverse as well. Businesses have the right to record customers without their consent, but not the other way around? Man wasn't seriously hurt, but his eyeglass was damaged. So who has to bear the cost when augmentations are damaged? If you're in a place with free healthcare, is it covered if it's a disability aid? It's not always clear what safety profiles and side effects are, especially for new technologies. The potential for augmentation technology to be relied on so intensely that we forget how to function without them is a very real threat. Who bears responsibility for accidents caused by these devices? The wearer? The manufacturer? Nobody? Your guess is as good as mine. What about the accidents that could happen that we wouldn't even notice? The potential for nefarious groups to subtly hijack these technologies is still pretty speculative, but it's easy to see how it could be done and how dangerous it could be. Some devices like pacemakers and insulin pumps use software to run, and as such, it is possible to hack them. A few years ago, researchers at the Black Hat Cybersecurity Conference demonstrated firmware attacks on pacemakers and insulin pumps by the manufacturer Medtronic. These attacks could force devices to administer extra treatment, including shocks, or withhold treatment, including insulin. In 2017, the FDA recalled about half a million pacemakers that they deemed vulnerable to cyber attacks. Former US Vice President Dick Cheney had the wireless functions of his pacemaker disabled for that very reason. Despite the risk of this being very low, it is never zero, and for a life-saving medical device, this is a big problem. What happens when more and more of our body parts start relying on software to function? What if your AR headset made everyone registered to a certain political party seem just a bit more attractive? 
Or what if your augmented olfactory system, aka your sense of smell, was hijacked by a perfume company to make their competitor's storefront smell a little worse? Even more concerning, what if your cognition could be hacked into and compromised? Inequitable access is also a big issue. Many of these technologies have the potential to greatly improve quality of life for those with disabilities, yet how likely is it that they're going to be at the front of the line? What if only the wealthy and powerful had access to these technologies? What if they could make themselves superhumanly smart, fast, strong, perceptive, and healthy, while the rest of us can't? We don't have the answers to these questions yet, but that doesn't mean they're not important to ask. After all, questions are how we discover answers, and that's the foundation of all research. As we've discussed, some of the first serious implementations of cyborgian technology already exist in accessibility tech. Prosthetics, sensory implants, IUDs, and pacemakers all fall under this category. We can probably even count glasses, depending on your own personal definition. Some people in our current society are taking matters into their own hands by biohacking themselves into having better genes, smarter brains, and healthier bodies. Some of these methods are more effective than others, and some are downright dangerous. But there's no question, you don't need a fancy R&D lab to change your body with technology. If given the opportunity, would you get chromed? In 2018, a survey was conducted that essentially asked that question. While 95% of the respondents said they supported using enhancement technology for therapeutic restoration, such as replacing a lost limb, fewer than 35% agreed with using human enhancement for the sake of enhancement. Many people are nervous around the concept of cybernetic enhancements, but I think it's important to look back and remind ourselves of what Kleins and Klein felt the whole point of being a cyborg is. The purpose of the cyborg, as well as his own homeostatic systems, is to provide an organizational system in which such robot-like problems are taken care of automatically and unconsciously, leaving man free to explore, to create, to think, and to feel. Despite popular belief, the original idea behind the cyborg was not for us to become less human, but to allow us to be more human. So what do you think? When the time comes, and I think it will, will you get enhanced?